good afternoon. We are going to start on a new topic today. Uh, that is going to be about alternating current. So uh, until now, what we had seen was DC circuit. So let me just write until now DC circuit we had seen. So which actually allows current flow only in one direction. So this allows current flow in one direction. So the source normally we saw was a battery. So I'm going to have a battery like this and always the current flows from the positive. So if I call this as positive and this is negative and it is going to flow through the load or whatever circuit it is and then it is going to return to negative. So this is unidirectional. So whenever we talk about unidirectional current, we call that as a DC circuit. OK, whereas uh, we saw one more category which is transients in DC circuits itself. So this happened every time there is a disturbance in the circuit. Maybe you disconnect, you connect uh, a capacitor, an inductance, a resistance, whatever. So dis disturbance in the circuit and we looked at the response for a short while. This is only for a short while. So these are the two categories of responses that we had seen so far. Now what we are going to look at is a current which is going to flow. Let us say this is my source. I'm going to show the source like this. And let us say I have a load. OK, and if I call this as the complete circuit, I'm just showing a simple circuit. And if I say this is A and this is B, Sometimes the current is going to flow from A to B and another time it is going to flow from B to A. So this is going to happen repeatedly. So when the current changes its direction. Right. Alternatively, so that is it is going to go from one point to another and again come back from that point to the previous point. So this we call as alternating current. So the alternating current circuits generally we call simply as AC circuit. So AC circuits are the one which we are going to concentrate right now. And if I try to look at the alternating current, I may have the current in a particular direction probably for some time and another direction for some time. So I may call this direction of current as for example positive, which means automatically this direction of current becomes negative by our convention. So I will have positive current. If I try to plot the current, it is going to be positive for some time and it is going to be negative for some time and it is going to repeat itself like this. So this is with respect to time. We call this as the waveform of the alternating current. So we call this as the waveform. The plot of the current with respect to time, we call this as waveform of the alternating current that we are looking at. In general, any plot of a quantity with respect to time, we normally call that as waveform. That's what we call as waveform. OK, so I'm talking about alternating current here, which actually is being plotted with respect to time. The current is being plotted with respect to time. It could be uh, the current here I have shown is like a rectangular waveform. So it is going to maintain a constant quantity with respect to time during positive half cycle. Again, another constant quantity during the negative half cycle and it repeats itself. OK, so it could be triangular waveform as well. It cannot it need not be rectangular. It could be triangular, so it can be somewhat like this. It can be just going like this, right? So it could be triangular waveform as well. Or it could be a sinusoidal waveform. So I'm going to have in the case of a sinusoidal waveform with respect to time, if I plot, I will have a sinusoid like this, OK? So this is essentially a sinusoidal waveform. And if you look at many of the circuits, what we are looking generally at home or in an industry or anywhere, most of them have sinusoidal voltages and sinusoidal currents. OK, 
And if you look at even communication circuits, many of the radio frequency oscillations and other things, all of them have sinusoid. So by and large, we are going to deal with only sinusoidal circuits. So our concentration is going to be on sinusoidal waveforms of voltages and currents. OK, so I have shown three types of alternating current waveforms here, but primarily we are going to deal with sinusoidal waveforms. And if you look at uh, any generating station, most of the generating stations only generate sinusoidal currents and sinusoidal voltages. Only way where we are generating DC is from solar PV. Solar PV generates DC. It doesn't generate sinusoidal waveform. But if you look at wind energy conversion systems, if you look at the thermal power stations, if you look at hydropower stations or nuclear power stations, all of them generally generate only sinusoidal waveform. So how is the sinusoidal waveform generated? Let's try to take a quick look at that. So I'm going to talk about first generation of sinusoidal waveform. So I'm not saying specifically voltage or current because if I apply a sinusoidal voltage and if I'm going to have a resistance or uh, any of the uh, linear circuit elements like inductance, capacitance, I'll get again sinusoidal or cosinusoidal waveform as output current. If I apply a voltage in an inductance, which is sinusoidal, I'll get again a cosinusoidal or sinusoidal current. The same is the case with resistance or inductance. So I am basically talking about sinusoidal waveform, be it voltage or current. So how is this generated if you look at it? If I have a north pole here and a south pole here, okay, and I'm going to have a coil which is sitting in between these two. So let us say the coil I'm showing as a rectangular coil. So this is how the rectangular coil is represented. So I'm going to have a coil like this. How we are going to move this coil is a matter of detail, but I'm going to have a coil like this. Let us see. OK, and I'm calling one side of the coil as A, another coil, uh, side of the coil as B. And please remember, it's all three dimensional. It is not going to be just a two dimensional arrangement. So I have to have a solid magnet which is actually going inside, inside the board. You imagine it that way. And I'm going to have the lines, magnetic field lines going from north to south. Obviously, it will be a closed path for the magnetic field lines also, but I'm showing only one side of the picture. So I'm going to have essentially the magnetic field lines going like this. OK, now if I am actually having this plane of this particular coil exactly parallel to the plane of North Pole or South Pole, OK, and I'm going to try to rotate this. So let me show you the arrangement, the figure from the book. I hope you are able to see this. So this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. And the coil is here, which is attached to a spindle. So the spindle is going to continuously rotate. It is going to be rotated probably by a steam turbine, probably by a hydro turbine, a wind turbine, whatever it is. So it is going to be rotated. So right now the coil is exactly parallel to the magnets, two magnets. So if I am trying to look at the coil at this position, so here is my coils cross section and this is the other coils cross section. OK, and it is probably going to rotate, let us say in anti-clockwise direction or something like this. So it is going to rotate in this particular direction. So currently when you are looking at it, I'm going to have basically this is the North Pole, this is the South Pole, and I'm going to show as though this is uh, the complete cylinder. Probably I have several coils, but I'm showing only one coil right now. And I have the uh, coil B here and coil A here. OK, so if I'm concentrating on coil B, it is rotating. And if I try to look at the velocity, it is exactly in this direction. And this is going to be the velocity tangentially in this direction. And if I am looking at the magnetic uh, lines, 
I'm going to have the magnetic line somewhat like this. So I will really not have any component of velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field line it is exactly parallel to the magnetic field line. So if I am talking about uh, the EMF generated, right? You guys must have definitely studied Biot Stavart's law as well as Fleming's rule. This is basically B cross V velocity. So if I say whatever is the velocity multiplied by uh, the cross product of flux density and the velocity is going to be the EMF generated. And of course it has to be multiplied by the length of the conductor. If I call this as length, so I'm going to have this multiplied by the length of the conductor as well. This is going to be the EMF generated in conductor A or B individually. Right? So in this particular case, because the velocity happens to be in parallel with your, uh, you know, this uh, particular uh, flux line. So you are not going to really get any EMF generated at this particular point in time when I am having the coils plane exactly parallel to the plane of the magnet itself. Whereas when I'm going to have this rotated by an angle theta, so I'm going to have North Pole here and South Pole here. And if I look at the coil, originally it was in this position. Now it is rotated by an angle theta. So this is my theta. So I'm going to have essentially A conductor here and B conductor here. OK, so if I try to look at the velocity at this point, I have to show the velocity somewhat like this. Again, I have to show it tangentially. So this will be the velocity. So here the velocity was exactly parallel to this, whereas now I'm going to have the velocity somewhat like this. So I should take the velocity component, which is actually perpendicular to the uh, field lines. So I'm going to have the velocity component, which is taken somewhere like this, which is going to be perpendicular to the field lines. The field lines are in this direction, this time. So I'm going to have the field lines in this direction. So I have to take the perpendicular component of velocity. So if I say this is V, this will be very clearly V sine theta. This is going to be V sine theta is the velocity component perpendicular to the field lines, magnetic field lines. Right. So I can write at any position theta with reference Mom? to yeah yeah when it is in circular uh, what is the direction of the lines magnetic field lines let me probably show you the figure again from the book probably it will make better sense for you are you getting this the lines are like this and the coils cross section that is this and this is shown here. OK, and the rotation is in the anticlockwise direction. And when you are having maximum lines are covered by the area covered by this conductor, several lines are coming here from top to bottom. So I'm going to have from top to bottom large number of lines are coming here, but if you look at the velocity versus the lines, they are going to be exactly parallel to each other because this is also coming from top to bottom and the, the velocity direction you understand it is essentially like this. It is going like this, so it should be parallel. So the field lines and the velocity will be parallel to each other. For both are vertical basically. OK, whether you look at A or B, whereas here it is slightly slanted. When I'm going to have A and B like this, the velocity is slanting. And because the velocity is slanting as compared to the vertical field lines, I'm going to have definitely components of velocity which is vertical and horizontal. And the horizontal component of velocity is going to be perpendicular to the field lines, which will contribute towards the production of EMF or current. Is this clear? So at any position theta, I'm going to write that the in 
So the induced EMF in the conductor is going to be B L and if the angle is sine theta normally when it is uh, you know uh, zero originally it was zero so that's why sine zero we got hardly any induced EMF so I'm going to have B L V sine theta. OK, now how do you find out the direction of current? We have to first of all get that also. I hope you guys know that Fleming's rule is normally used for finding out either the direction of rotation in a motor or the direction of uh, induced EMF in a generator. So Fleming's right hand rule generally is used for generator action and left hand rule is used for motoring action. OK, so if I am going to let me probably uh, go back to this and then uh, turn the video on and unshare the screen so that I would be able to show you basically my fingers. OK, so are you able to see my fingers? So I'm going to use my right hand specifically for the generator operation. So I have put the index finger down. OK, and I have put the two other fingers, middle finger, middle finger represents the magnetic field, index finger represents the current induced and the thumb what I am moving that represents the direction of force or thrust. OK, so I'm going to talk about the velocity as the direction of the uh, thrust or uh, thumb and this particular finger, which is middle finger as the magnetic field direction. And this is going to be the direction corresponding to the current. OK, so let me please imagine this. If you have your fingers like this, let me again share the screen and draw the directions of all three things. OK, so let me turn off the video also and let me try to share. Yeah, so I'm going to draw this now. So if if I am going to have. The middle finger somewhat like this, which is representing the magnetic field. OK, and if I'm going to have the thumb showing this direction, which is the thrust. Or force or velocity, I may write this as velocity rather than thrust because we are talking about velocity here. So this is the velocity. OK, and if I am talking about what is the direction of induced EMF or current, it will be like this. So this is the current direction or induced uh, current direction. So this is going to be the generator action which is corresponding to the right hand rule. So if I am looking at this as the magnetic field which is going down, OK, and I'm having the velocity in upward direction so I can rotate this entire thing the other way around. So magnetic field is uh, down. Right and the current is going to probably show up like this and I should show the velocity in this particular direction. OK, so this is going to be velocity. This is the magnetic field and this is the current. So if I am trying to look at it this way. You will have actually velocity uh, in this particular case, especially well, uh, the movement is upward. If I have the movement upward, I will not have anything at all because they are parallel to each other. Whereas here, if I'm trying to look at the direction like this, the movement is like this, whereas for this, the movement is going to be in the opposite direction. Please note A and B are having opposite directions of movement because the entire thing is attached to a cylinder. So I'm going to have a cylinder in whose periphery these conductors are inserted. So imagine this is my cylinder. The cylinder is going into the board and I'm going to have the two conductors attached to the periphery of the cylinder. So I'm going to have one of them actually having the movement like this, the other one having the movement like this in A and B conductors. So 
I am going to have actually dot current here and cross current here. I should also explain what is dot and cross. If I am having an arrow like this, this is indicative of the current direction. If I am visualizing it from this direction, it will look like a dot. Whereas if I am visualizing it from this direction, imagine the arrow having some cross at the back. So it is going to visualize, it is going to look at it as a cross. So this conductor which is going into the board is going to carry the current outward. Whereas this conductor which is going into the board will carry the current inward. So this will look like a cross and this will look like a dot. That is what I'm trying to say. OK, so I'm going to have B carrying a dot current and A carrying a cross current. OK, so I am going to have basically. One major thing I have to say is the current what is induced is going to have a sinusoidal function with respect to the theta position the conductors are occupying. That is the first and foremost point. So the induced current is going to have a sinusoidal function. That is the first point with reference to the position occupied by the conductors. So first thing is we are going to have a sinusoidal current induced with respect to the position occupied by the conductor. OK, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am here in the drawing you said A is going A inside cross and B is dot, right? Hmm. Hmm. And we know the magnetic field and the current flow. So we know the current flow. There is the. No, 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 no. If we know the velocity direction and the magnetic field, we will know the current flow direction. Please remember that this is generator action, not motor action. In generator, you are providing mechanical input power. You are rotating the conductor. When you rotate the conductor, you are providing the mechanical power by let me again go back to probably the book and show you exactly. So we will actually attach the shaft of the turbine here. So it is going to rotate this particular conductor in clockwise direction or anti-clockwise direction depending upon what kind of prime mover power I am giving in which direction. OK, so a and B right now are occupying a position which is parallel to the magnet. As I rotate it, it is going to become slanting. So let me see whether there are more diagrams. If there is more diagram, then you know. So they have again not shown the complete position of the conductor, but you can see that this is slanting. So it has rotated by certain angle already. Are you getting my point? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. So we are basically saying that the prime mover, which is a steam turbine or hydro turbine, is providing the mechanical power, which is rotating this conductor. The, this is like a bouquet of conductor. I have shown only one. There can be multiple conductors along the periphery of the cylinder. So what I drew here, like a cylinder on the, you know, here, so I have shown only two conductors sitting here, but there will be definitely more number of conductors which we are right now not talking about. I will have one conductor corresponding return conductor will be here. Similarly, I may have one more conductor here whose return conductor will be here. So if one is carrying dot, the other one will carry cross. So if you are looking at it, because the movement of the conductor in one case, if it is from left uh, right to left the other one will look as though it is from left to right are you getting my point because the entire thing is rotating like this this is going to rotate like this so obviously these two look as though they are in the opposite sense so if i am going to have a dot current induced here automatically cross will be induced here and vice versa okay so yes, it, yeah so you it is said as, there are multiple coils right yes but right now we are considering only one coil Okay, ma'am. Yeah. So we are going to have in B, 
if the current is actually coming out in A, the current is going in like this. So this is going to complete itself as a circuit. So this is actually A and this is going to be B. So this is how the entire circuit is completed and I may connect whatever my load here, maybe resistance, whatever I want to use here, I can connect the load. So this is my load and this is the generator conductor. Okay, and please remember these two currents are going to be additive. They are not going to oppose each other because one current is flowing in this direction. The other current is flowing in the other direction. So if I may even represent this as a source, I have to represent it like this. So this is going to be plus from which the current is emanating and I'm going to have again the current is flowing in this direction. So I will have a minus and plus like this. The current is again going like this. You get my point. So these two voltage sources are going to be added. OK, so I can say basically I'm going to have an EMF which is going to be or the voltage which is going to be V L V sine theta per conductor. So if I have two conductors, I can multiply this by two. So I should be able to say this as two V L V sine theta. And if there are n conductors, if I say that there are number of conductors is L n. And if I'm going to say that all of them are connected in series here, I have connected these two in series. So if I'm going to connect all of them in series, I have to multiply this by n. So the total number of conductors, whatever I have multiplied by the total voltage that is generated, right? That has to be multiplied by n. But you remember here already we have multiplied by two. So I have to divide by two here. So I should say n by 2 multiplied by B L V sine theta. So this is going to be essentially n B L V sine theta is the total EMF generated by the machine at any instant of time. So you should understand that as the theta traverses more and more angle, when it becomes 90, I will have maximum induced EMF. And when it is going to go to, you know, from theta, if it goes to the other side where theta becomes uh, greater than, you know, 180, it is going to become definitely negative as it because this B will come here and A will go there. So what was considered to be dot current now will become that conductor will carry cross current and vice versa. You understand? So if I try to plot basically how the current comes up in this particular conductor, whether it is A or B, I should draw it as though initially it is at a minimum value. Then it goes to a peak value that is corresponding to 90 degrees. And it will come to zero value again when it comes to 180 degrees and it is going to increase in the negative direction and it is going to go down to again zero value when it is 360 degrees. So if I try to look at this as theta, this is the kind of variation I will have in the current or voltage because if I'm connecting a resistance, voltage and current both will have similar variations. If I'm going to connect a resistance as the load like I have shown here, they will have similar variations. So this is going to be voltage and this is going to be current. Right? So I will have this basically this theta, how quickly it varies. That is going to definitely depend upon how fast this conductor is rotated, how fast I'm going to rotate the conductor. OK, so if I call this entire period as T. Right? This is the time period that is uh, expended in traversing from 0 degree to 360 degree. So if I am going to have N revolutions, capital N revolutions per second. So the conductor makes N revolutions per second. 
So I'm going to have 2 pi n as the total number of or total angle traversed by the conductor in one second. That means I'm going to have actually n such oscillations per second. So I'm going to have n oscillations per second. So which means that decides what is the frequency of this particular sinusoidal voltage or current I am creating in the form of alternating current when I attach this coil to a prime mover which is rotating at n revolutions per second, I'm going to have the frequency to be n basically. So frequency is going to be n hertz when I'm going to have n such revolutions made by this particular conductor which is attached to the prime. Is this clear? So the frequency is dependent upon what is the prime mover speed. That's what I'm trying to get. At. So I should say very clearly the EMF what is induced is I'm talking about this as N B L V sin theta. So this is the EMF which is actually corresponding to the complete uh, you know the number of uh, conductors which is actually N but it is also going to be increasing in terms of its frequency if I try to look at it. So I should say that this is going to depend upon definitely the position theta and the frequency is going to depend upon how much is the prime mover speed that we are actually looking at which is given as the mechanical energy input to the generator. OK, so naturally what we see being generated in a generator which is generating single phase alternating. This is known as single phase because I have only one particular uh, alternating voltage. If I'm having more than one, which we will be dealing with later, we call that as either two phase or three phase. If I'm going to have two alternating voltages like this, maybe one is like this. The other one is maybe shifted slightly from the first one. So we call this as two phase. And instead of that, if I have three such things, so I'm going to have, let us say, one sinusoid like this. And maybe I'm going to have second sinusoid, which is probably going to be somewhat like this, which is shifted from 120 degrees. And I'm going to have a third sinusoid generated, which is going to be somewhat like this. So we call this as three phase. We call this as two phase. And we call this as single phase or one phase. OK, so we yeah. Here the phases are dependent on N, right? The, no, no, the phases are dependent upon the position of the conductor. Let me again probably draw in the next one. So if I have, let us say, this is the magnet and I'm going to just place two conductors like this. I can place actually multiple conductors right next to each other. They can be a bunch of conductor completely. So I can have A here and A dash here, for example. OK, so this is going to have an induced EMF. I can have an independent circuit which is probably shifted from this by 120 degrees. So instead of having A and A dash like this, let us say I have from here 120 degrees means I have to show somewhere here. I'm going to have B here and exactly opposite to that, I'm going to have B dash, for example. And I'm going to have another conductor which is again 120 degrees shifted from here. So I will have somewhere here C and I'm going to have C dash. And I'm having these three as independent circuits. So in which case I can connect, let us say this is A and A dash. 
I'm showing this coil as B and B dash, and this is going to be C and C dash. So obviously, after A faces North Pole, if I try to rotate it is in this direction, B will face the same North Pole after 120 degrees of rotation. And C will face the North Pole after another 120 degrees of rotation. So if I try to look at the sinusoid across A and A dash, then B and B dash, and C and C dash, the three are going to be shifted from each other like what I have shown here. So this will be for A, this will be for B, and this is going to be for C. You get my point? So yes. I will be able to generate three independent sinusoids, right, completely by having three windings which are spatially shifted from each other. Okay, so this is three phase EMF generation, which we will eventually talk about. Right now, I just wanted to tell you that the previous one, what I have shown, that is single phase. And when I say single phase, I have to qualify what are the other phases that are available. That's why I just introduced what is two phase and what is three phase. Okay. Mom, I have another doubt. Huh? A and A dash are both different conductors or are they the same conductor? It is two different conductors, but which are connected together. So if I have to show this, I should show as though A is going into the board like this and it is going to return through this. Mom, so what will be the value of N small n in uh, the EMF? See, I am going to have, if I have only one conductor, it is only two turns. I mean, it, it is two conductors which are making, making up for one turn. I can call this entire thing as a turn because it is turning around and coming back. So I am having a conductor which is turning around and coming back. So two conductors make one turn. It makes one turn. So if I can... I have multiple, say, A1, A2, A3 together. Similarly, here A1 dash, A2 dash, A3 dash together. So I'll have six conductors. So I'm talking about this N as six. Are you getting my point? But okay. there can be infinite number of conductors then, right? You can, you can, but you have to understand that this is a physical machine. So you yes. can't have infinite number of conductors in a physical machine, can you? No, then it, what will the value of N be? It will because be depending upon the design. Points, right? It will be depending upon the design. If I want to design the machine for 100 volts, if I have to have, let us say, 10 conductors, if I have to multiply, uh, I want to have it for 200 volts, I have to have 20 conductors. As simple as that. Right? Because of, they are all connected in series. If I assume all of them are connected in series, if 10 conductors give me 100 volts, Right? Depending upon what is the flux density and all. Because P, B multiplied by L multiplied by V sine theta. This is what we said. And when theta is 90, I'm going to have the peak value. Peak value happens when theta equal to 90. So B, L and V, all of them are going to decide what is the kind of voltage I am getting from a conductor. What is the length of the conductor? What is the flux density and what is the kind of velocity? Please remember, V in this particular case is going to be R times omega, right? And omega is essentially radians per second. How many uh, radians my machine has, uh, my conductor has traversed in one second? So what we talked about in the previous thing, we said that if there are n, revol uh, n revolutions per second, 2 pi n is the radians per second it is going to traverse. So obviously, I am going to have this V being replaced by 2 pi n times R, where R is, if I talk about this as the cylinder inside which the conductors are inserted. So this is the R I am talking about. I hope you understand. This is the cylinder. And at the periphery of the cylinder, I am inserting the conductor. Okay, fine. So this is going to be 2 pi n times r. So I will have the EMF to be 2 pi capital N, which is the number of revolutions per second 
R, which is the radius of this particular uh, cylinder in which the conductors are inserted. Then I have to multiply this by N, B, L, of course, sine theta. So I have expanded the whole thing. So I am going to have the induced EMF. Frequency is definitely dependent upon the number of revolutions, no doubt. And also the magnitude is dependent upon the number of revolutions. The number what I'm having in terms of uh, the total number of conductors. And I'm going to have this B, which is the flux density and the length of the conductor. All of them. You get my point? OK. Is this clear? B is Any? flux density or magnetic field? That is the magnetic flux density. Magnetic field is mag not magnetic field intensity. Not at all. Magnetic field intensity is different. You guys might have studied B by mu equal to H. Right? We are talking about flux density. What is the effect? Once you have a magnet, it can be a permanent magnet. So if it is a permanent magnet, there is no question of any current or anything there. We are basically talking about what is the kind of number of field lines we have. That is generally called the flux density. So magnetic field lines, how many field lines are there per square meter of area? That is what is generally flux density. So I'm going to say this is essentially the flux density. So B is basically the flux density that I'm talking about magnetic flux density. So how many lines I visualize between the North Pole and South Pole per square meter of area that is going to play a very, very vital role in deciding how much is the EMF induced. So to reiterate, we said B L V sine theta multiplied by the number of conductors. This is going to be the EMF induced at any instant of time. In you know the total number of conductors, if all of them are connected in series. OK, at any instant of time. So if I replace this velocity by 2 pi R multiplied by uh, what was it? Number of revolutions per second. Right? This is what we said. So I have to write this now as N 2 pi R and I have to write L and uh, N small n B and sine theta. That's it. So this is going to be the induced EMF. So the induced EMF definitely depends upon what kind of a powerful magnet you have. If the magnet is very powerful, you will have a higher voltage. If the magnet is not that powerful, you will have a lower voltage. Is that clear? The same way, if I have a long conductor, I'll have a higher amount of voltage. If it is not a very long conductor, I'll have a smaller amount of voltage. If the revolutions per second is really large, I'll have a higher uh, voltage. If it is the, the revolution per second is smaller, I will have a smaller voltage. So I am going to say that if I am given a machine, the length is fixed, right? Maybe the magnets are fixed, then I will have the flux density also fixed. So I will have the induced EMF being proportional to the speed of revolution of the prime. Fine. We will dwell on this definitely more oh, when we talk on. about machines. Yes. Ma'am, in this case, what all are constant? If I am talking about the given permanent magnet being fixed to my machine, this will be a constant. The number of conductors will be a constant. If it is a given machine, radius is going to be a constant. Length is a constant. You are given a machine, so nothing is going to change. Only thing that can be changed is revolution. Nothing else. Right? OK, but this is the instantaneous voltage, so I can talk about the peak value of voltage as 2 pi RL, which is the uh, surface area of the cylinder, which is having the conductor and the number of revolutions. Then 
Number of conductors, of course, is a fixed value for a given machine, and the flux or the magnetic field is also a constant value for a given machine. So this is the peak value of the voltage. So the crux of the matter is, I am going to have in a sinusoidal voltage generating machine, which is a generator, I am going to have basically the voltage coming up somewhat like this. This is how the voltage is going to be. OK, so if I try to look at the average value like what we saw in the DC. So in the case of a DC, the average value will be the same as whatever is the constant value of voltage that is being generated by the battery. So in the case of DC, average value is this DC value itself. Of the battery, whereas here if I try to look at the average value, please note the positive half cycle and negative half cycle are one and the same. So average value is going to be zero. So in an AC, there is no point in talking about average value. But if I'm talking about the average value only until 180 degrees, I can at least calculate something like this. V average for this particular waveform will be zero to 180 degrees. Vm sin theta d theta, if I call this as Vm, for example. OK, so I can say the average has to be done with respect to only until 180 degrees. It is if I write it in radians, it is 1 by pi. So I can write this as Vm divided by pi. And for sine, when I take essentially the uh, integral, I'm going to say minus cos theta and I can write it with T0 to 180 degrees. So this will be cos 0 minus cos 180. So I will get this as 2 Vm by pi. Right, cos 0 is 1, 1 minus minus 1. So this is going to be 2 Vm by pi. So if I try to look at the average value only for one half cycle, which is the positive half cycle, I may call this as positive half cycle and this is negative half cycle. Right, so I'm going to have the average value if I just look at only one half cycle will be 2 Vm by pi. But assume that I'm applying this voltage to a resistance. I know that I equal to V by R in any resistance. Please note I'm writing I as an instantaneous value. V also should be instantaneous value. So this will be Vm sine theta divided by R. This will be maybe Im sine theta. So if I try to look at what kind of heating effect it pro produces in the resistance, it will be essentially I square R. Am I right? So I should say this will be I square R and I can integrate it over 0 to 2 pi or 0 to pi. It doesn't matter. And if I want to look at the average value of heating effect produced, I have to write this average over 1 by 2 pi and I have to say this is d theta. So this is essentially the averaged value of heating effect. Ma'am, yeah. why do I take in pi and not pi? You can take pi also. There is nothing wrong. I am taking it over one full cycle. You can do it for pi also. No problem at all. You can do it over pi. Then the average value also should be over pi. You can do it that also. It won't cancel out. It won't cancel out because that's why I just wanted to draw the waveform as well. If this is going to be my current, what will be I square? What will be I square? Only positive side. Exactly. So that is the reason I'm going to get essentially this as I square. So that's why it will not cancel out. So when we talk about the heating effect of this current, 
we will have to consider only the positive values we cannot consider the negative value because you have squared the current so if i want to know what is this i i have to essentially write this as 0 to pi i square d theta 1 by pi but square root of this you get my point this is going to be the square root of the squared instantaneous value of current. So what we are trying to do is actually we are taking the average value after squaring the current and taking the square root of that. So average. Ma'am, you missed our. OK, you OK. Ma'am, that is RMS value, right? Exactly. So that is the reason why we call this as RMS root mean square. So the squared value of currents mean is taken and we are taking the square root of that. So average or mean value. Mean value of squared. Current. We take and we take the square root of that. So that is the reason why we call this as RMS, root mean square. So Ma we are, yeah. The voltage we haven't taken in RMS, right? It's just the average between 0 to pi. See, that I had calculated as average value. I have not calculated the RMS value. We have taken only 0 to pi. If we had taken 0 to 2 pi, the average value will be 0. The average value over one cycle will be zero. But average value over half a cycle. That is a finite value, which is 2 Vm by pi. Whereas if I try to look at the RMS value, I should be able to calculate this as I RMS is equal to right square root of we had already written that the waveform is I m sine omega t. This or sine theta. That's what we wrote. Remember, we wrote this as I m sine theta. Why did we write? We had written it here, right? I have written it here. I m sine theta. So I can write this as I m sine theta. So I'm going to just say. This is 0 to pi or 0 to 2 pi either way is fine 1 by 2 pi i m square sine square theta d theta. 1 by 2 pi or 1 by pi if i am taking until 2 pi i better average it over 2 pi if i am taking only until pi i average it over pi as simple as that both are one and the same are you getting my point? Because you already saw that when I square the current, both sides are exactly the same. If I try to look at the area under this curve and area under this curve, it is going to be one and the same. This will be 0 to pi and this is 0 to 2 pi. Either way is fine. Is that clear? So I can write this as 1 divided by 2 pi and I have to write, of course, I m square divided by 2 pi. And sine theta, sine square theta, I can write this as 1 minus cos 2 theta divided by 2. So I can write this as 4 pi and I can integrate this from 0 to 2 pi d theta. And I have to take the square root. So this cos 2 theta when I integrate over 0 to 2 pi will give me actually sine 2 theta divided by 2 and sine 2 theta 0 to 2 pi, both limits are going to give me 0 values. So I can write this as I m square divided by 4 pi and multiplied by 2 pi minus 0. And I have to take the square root, which will give me I m divided by root 2. So this is going to be the RMS value. So RMS value for the entire current waveform is going to be peak divided by root 2. Whereas 
if I try to look at average value only for the half cycle, positive half cycle, is going to give me, we calculated this, which is 2 IM by pi. If I write in terms of the current, I should write this as 2 IM by pi. Now, average by RMS generally is known as, rather RMS by average is generally known as form factor. This is used very, very commonly in especially sinusoidal waveform. This will come out to be 1 by root 2 divided by 2 by pi. I am cancelling out IM. Okay. So this will come out to be, please verify this. This will be 1.11. Okay. This is used very, very commonly. Uh, this is uh, for the calculation of number of conductors, the voltage and so on. For many design of machines, this is used very, very commonly. But we will look at when we excite maybe a resistance or inductance or capacitance with this kind of a sinusoidal voltage, how the circuit is going to behave in the upcoming classes. Okay, so I have only introduced alternating current and alternating voltage to you, their average values and their other, uh, you know, the RMS value and so on in the ratio, which is known as form factor. Those things I have introduced. So we'll go ahead further with the alternating voltage and alternating current in subsequent classes.